are well. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> um, most objects are well uh, seen and depicted on top of that neutral gray. And that gives you a good standardized color background for all your collections. Um, so if you buy something like that, you can standardize your documentation. And then if you put a color card into that photograph or nearby, you'll be able to color balance your uh, object and the self. So I think to, it's, a, it's a good part to start with um, is photo documentation as much as you can. And that way you're building the uh, condition assessment. You're going to be able to start from your a term of, of your involvement with the collection going forward. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about putting old documents and trying to um, utilize old uh, records into a new format and, and carry that. But documentation, uh, photographic documentation, your first step. Can I get the next slide, please? So along with the, the uh, accessioning of an object into your collection, I just this uh, this little headlamp. It's just a, a nice little tool. I recommend getting something like this because what's in critical or important to do within each one of the assessments that you do for an object is to do this full-on condition assessment to the object before you accession it into the collection or if it's in the collection already and you're reviewing its accession, trying to, to line up the past information or the number that may be assigned or associated with an object, it's critical at that time to do a assessment because that's your benchmark. That's, that's where you can start to evaluate. And then from there, you can build a understanding of how the collection is, is in the storage facility or on exhibition, you can see subtle changes. Um, you can see if things have, ch have changed like glue blocks or uh, other adhesives or paint films, things like that. So you start documenting from square one. Um, and things like a headlamp or um, photographic light stands, um, something like that, that, that you can really um, get in and look at all of the aspects of the object is, is critical. I know sometimes house museums or other institutions, lighting is, is poor, and it really skews the, uh, the evaluation of an object. So can I get the next uh, slide, please? So along with the, the examination or analysis during the initial accession, as I say, whether the object has been in your collection for 100 years or five minutes, it's critical to look and evaluate the, the object. So um, I have a picture here of a UV light. Um, again, uh, finances, uh, you know, it, it, they are not inexpensive, but if you have a budget to be able to afford one, a good UV lamp with both short wave and long wave bulbs, and this one in particular has a, a magnifying light uh, in it as well. It's a nice little tool. This is from Talus. It's just one of their stock items in Talus, uh, which is a company that sells conservation materials, supplies, equipment, things like that. Um, but what's nice about a UV light is it can show you uh, if there are been, have been old repairs or if something maybe has been um, re-varnished because the light will, will be very different in an area, uh, it will fluoresce, it will auto-fluoresce. Um, if anyone is, is more interested about the diagnostic abilities of a UV light, we can talk about it in the, the time afterwards or you can always send me an email and we can discuss it, but it's a great tool. It can tell you uh, a lot about a painting, sometimes about prints or drawings. 
uh, a great deal about furniture with things like uh, adhesive used or um, coatings on the surface, whether you have a varnish or or maybe a wax. So um, there's a lot of literature out there. Uh, I have some lists at the end of the talk about resources or reference material. You can find a lot on the web uh, regarding the use of UV. Um, the other thing I just have there is your standard set of Q-tips. Um, in conservation, we just use buckets and buckets and buckets of, of Q-tips. They're great to clean, um, but also you can take a swab of an object that you might be suspicious of, um, say there's mold or fungus or dirt. You can take a simple swab, look under some magnification, and kind of see if you've got dirt or if there's something else going wrong. So it's, it's good to have a uh, analytical sampling strategy in place for your collection so that you're not just looking at it from the macro sense, but you're also looking at, at the micro sense size of things. So you're, you're looking at what might be occurring on the surface. Um, with collections that are in your already, well, the environment and things like mold or fungus or anything growing like that, it might be a systemic issue within your institution, and that's a different uh, set of, of conditions that you can deal with as it relates to the collection. Um, if it's something like you're, you're going to um, be working on a collection or something is recently been uh, transferred into your collection or moved around, frankly, from one spot to another spot. Sometimes institutions have off-site storage and then they choose to bring it to a different location. It's critical to make these uh, evaluations or analysis for things like the presence of mold or mildew or, or fungus. And I recommend, if you can within your institution, have a, a little clean room area. It doesn't have to be a physical room. It can just be a space. And that way you isolate the object um, that you're going to be accessioning if you have any concerns or fear that it might be contaminating the rest of your collection. So if you're moving something from one side of a building or from the attic down to the first floor, things like that, you might want to create a little a static area uh, to do your assessing and your accessioning of the object. That way you don't have so much airflow or it's not going to send mold spores throughout the rest of your building and potentially contaminate the, the uh, other objects. Over on the far right, I have a bunch of little tools and, and these are just things that I have that I, I utilize a lot. Uh, bamboo, bamboo skewers, things like that are relatively soft. Sometimes you can use those to manipulate the surface. Sometimes they'll just be some gunk or grime or even sometimes paint from some overzealous uh, painter that was in your institution and now it's on the object. Um, so those can kind of be popped off or flecked off. Uh, dental tools, you can usually get them at a good hardware store. They're just a really good thing to have for some examination, some good tweezers, maybe some good pair of small needle nose pliers. Um, the other thing that's really quite uh, wonderful is these cosmetic sponges. That one there with the long white handle and the little yellow foam at the end, it's just a, a cheap cosmetic um, uh sponge. They make them in just plain sponges without handles. Those are really wonderful to wipe things down with, and they're non-abrasive. So if you're working on a collection and you're going to be accessioning, adding your your information onto a surface, it's, it's good to sort of wipe down that area. Microfiber cloths work well, but these sponges are really quite nice. Um, but I do, I do really, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the clean space, but I do really recommend if you're working, getting a collection out of storage within your institution and you're going to be working on it, that you have a designated 
clean space and keep it away from other objects. Can I get the next slide, please? So now um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, marking or um, putting accession numbers onto objects. Um, you probably within your collections have a whole host of numbering um, materials, numbering systems maybe. I know uh, from my experience with other institutions, they started with one system and they switched to another system. So it's not uncommon to uh, come across multiple digital uh, accessioning systems within one institution. Um, but if you're starting from square one and you're moving forward with accessioning your collections, um, I really like and highly recommend these um, real fine point uh, ink pens. Um, they can be, again, bought through an art supply store. What's nice about them is they have really ultra fine and fine and a medium point. And you can see from just the, the uh, information above the pen that you can get a very, very fine, thin, all the way up to a fat uh, marker. And uh, the company, if you can't quite see it, it's Faber-Castell. So they're a very, very nice um, marking pen. And you may have in your collections a variety of methodology to uh, put accession numbers on objects. I've seen everything from paint to uh, to whiteout to you name it, people have used it. Um, I would recommend personally, and, and if you are going to be applying a number to the surface of an object, if it's a three-dimensional object, whether it be wood or ceramic or bone or, or those types of materials, I would recommend recommend this sort of two-part system. I have a picture on the right, it's actually B72. Um, it's again sold from Talus, and that's a bag, and because I'm to conservation, I use it as an adhesive as well as this um, uh, coating for uh, recording numbers. You, no one that I, I think is, is on the, the webinar today is going to need a five pound bag of it is, is the long and the short. I think you've got maybe a pound at most that would last you for as long as you need it. It comes as in the center there, these little pellets, these little crystals, and it's dissolved in acetone, which you can get right from the hardware store. And once it's dissolved to like the consistency of fingernail polish, you can then apply a coat with just a small little disposable brush onto an object. And then once it is dried, and I usually wait at least a few hours, if not overnight. So if I'm doing a bunch of accessioning or labeling, I will put that base coat down on a bunch of objects and then wait till the next day and then actually apply with the Faber-Castell pens the, the numbers. Um, and then I will put another top coat of the acrylic on top, sealing the, the ink between the two layers. What's very nice about this system is it's completely reversible. And in conservation, we try to use materials that have both been tested um, and will not do any harm to an object. So the B72, can be used as an adhesive, but can also be used as this barrier coating or um, bottom base coat if you're doing lacing of an object. So I think it's a very, very good system. It's Frankly, it's what's used in most major institutions throughout the country. Um, if you can't or don't want to really do something like this, you could use fingernail polish that's uh, methyl methacrylate. It's, it's an okay, um, substitute, but as uh, you, many might know, uh, fingernail polish does chip and doesn't really sit on the on the object as well as the B72. So if you can't get the B72, you could definitely use the fingernail. And I would do the same thing. I would put fingernail polish down, 
let it thoroughly draw. Um, you don't want to use any fingernail polish that is any of these enamel things or these really tough um, uh, super coat, you know, things that, that are sold for the beauty uh, field that are supposed to be so durable because they will be then difficult to remove if you ever wanted to do it or might cause damage to the object. So if you're going to go the route of fingernail polish, get the cheap stuff. Don't, don't, don't invest in anything uh, high tech or wacky. Um, but I think this is a very good system. It will prevent things like using paint or other materials because this can be immediately removed with just a little bit of solvent on a Q-tip. Um, if you have a dark object and you want a sort of white background for then the labeling, I would say that you can do the same base coat on your object and then uh, apply white um, ink that you can get through an art supply store. It usually has a little bit of latex in it, frankly, but there are many white inks that are fine and, and good to use and you have that barrier beneath anyway so that's a that's a fine labeling system and then put the the your numbering system whatever you utilize different institutions use the date or maybe the collection that when it came in or uh sequential numbering some people use uh, alphanumeric i mean it's all across boards there's really no right or wrong it's what you will remember and <clears throat> pardon me be able to then uh, record and pass down to, you know, say next generation. So I would, again, um, be fairly straightforward in your uh, accessioning um, information and don't make it so arc that the next person doesn't know what you meant by double E, you know, 225. I mean, it might make sense to you, but is it really going to make sense to the next person? Um, so I would Try to, if you can, um, think about using this as a labeling system. Um, if you have two-dimensional objects, prints, um, photographs, things like that, pencil, believe it or not, but pencil is a, a absolutely fine, appropriate tool to use. Um, you can use a pencil in the like, margins of, of or the backs if you're not pushing really hard, but you're just lightly touching an object and leaving a pencil because that can always be removed later on. And if you do it in a very um, soft, methodical way, you won't be pressing or depressing into the, the surface of the, well, it will be the back, but into the paper itself. Well, uh, sometimes if you have a mat, you can do that. Um, or if there's other um, areas that are affixed to the object, but not necessarily part of the object itself, you can use a pencil. Um, the other great thing that you can buy through the archival companies are paper tags that can be tied on. The only problem with these that I've run across is if you're tagging everything with these little pieces of string and uh, paper tags, they can get pulled off, they can get lost, they can get detached from the object, and then it's basically no longer accessioned and you're really not sure what's going on with the piece. So they have their place, they have their use, but I, I would um, uh, question, you know, how, how uh, useful they are in some, in some situations. It depends what your institutions are and what your collections tend to be. Clearly, you can always mark the box if you're having two-dimensional objects in archival boxes, well, well then you can put accession and, and uh, other information on the exterior of the box and then maybe key it to interior sleeves or um, paper that might be separating um, each piece of, of artwork. So there are lots of ways that you can tailor it to your own institution or to your own needs. I just thought this would be something um, for labeling of objects that you might be interested in seeing. Um, once you start using things like 72, it's, it's very straightforward, easy to work with.
Um, can I get the next slide, please? So along with this recordation, um, and I talked about the um, clean space, while you're uh, reviewing the object, while you're accessioning it into your collection, um, it's a great time to do things like vacuuming or cleaning an object, um, both for its, its uh, long-term curation uh, concerns, but also just so you can properly evaluate the piece. If it's kind of covered in dust, well, you don't know that it's been um, re-varnished or it's had new glue uh, applied or the joint is loose or there's tarnish. And th so a good sort of uh, light cleaning is, is really uh, preferred at th that time. I just show you this little, for those that are close to Hackettstown, I'll give him a plug, the vacuum uh, guy on Main Street sells these little kits. They're like little attache cases with a variety of attachments. A uh, piece that's connected to the hose restricts the airflow. Therefore, you won't be using the vacuum on a full um, uh, suction. It reduces that or restricts the suction, which you want to first obviously test the the suction of your vacuum before you start going right at the object. So see how strong it is. You you don't want to, if you have textiles, you want to reduce the airflow so it's removing the dirt but not pulling the fibers and the same thing with two-dimensional work. But it's a good step where you can um, sort of production line in a, in a sense. If you're going to take out a bunch of collections to um, – to assign an accession number into the collection to give it a once over lightly cleaning and documentation. Well, then you now know from this day on, this day forward, you have the condition assessment and you have its overall dimensions and its material. So that way, going forward with your documentation, you can go back and look at an object and see how it's. It's um, it's within the collection how well it's doing, or if it needs conservation, or if it's uh, you know showing signs of, of deterioration. It's critical uh, when you have collections that are being used for uh, either uh, study collections or um, sometimes student. Uh, if you're going to be doing uh, open houses or working with the public and you're using part of your collection uh, as study pieces, it's good practice to document it fully first so that if you are working with those collections and you're handing them out to the public for them to touch and feel and, and work with, that you have that baseline so that you know that you could take that, say, off uh, its rotation and put another one in. For example, um, when I worked at the South Street Seaport Museum, we had so many cannonballs. And when the kids would come in to see the museum and we would be talking about cannons and cannonballs, we would actually have one or two that we could pass around to the kids. And then we would be able to refer back to its accession information, its, its recordation, its its uh, file. And with the photographs, we could say, well, gee, this one is not faring too well. It's been passed around. It's been accidentally dropped too many times. And we're now going to take that out of its rotation. And we have others that we're going to start to use. And we'll just retain this one in the archives or in the collection. So it's a good thing to start building all of that information as you start your accession in. Um, one last thing to also talk about um, before I go on to the next slide is that as you're doing this uh, accessioning of your collections, I think it's, it's an important thing to keep in the back of your mind is how things are interacting with each other. Um, and if you can make decisions once they have properly been recorded into your system, uh, make decisions on placement. Where is it going to be stored? How is it going to be stored? Um, 
For instance, there are many materials that do not do well when they're stored near other objects that they, for instance, silver. Silver tarnishes when there's a lot of sulfur in the air. If you had collections of of early plastics or synthetic, sometimes um, people might in a house museum have early plastics or early synthetic uh, things like um, uh, desk sets or combs and brushes and things like that. Those early synthetics, whether they're celluloid or bakelite or um, parxine or some of these other materials, well, they really react to high humidity. They react uh, to uh, light levels. So if you have high light levels, they can actually start to deteriorate by themselves and they can off gas things like nitric acid and other chemical compounds that might react to other objects. So you might have a vanity set of brushes and combs and they're stored next to just because it's the same collection. It could be part of some person's, you know, personal effects that are now curated into your museum, into your collections. And there might be textiles that are next to the comb and the brush and whatnot. So as you're going through your collections, you might see that the comb and the brush are actually causing the, the fabric or the textile to deteriorate rapidly. So as you're assessing, assessing, assessing sorry, <laughs> hard one for me today, um, or looking through your collection as you're inventorying, cataloging, it's a good time to, to evaluate the condition, but also have things, um, the understanding of, of like things is, does this uh, object interact or can it potentially interact with other objects that are stored in the same box or on the same shelf or in the same area? Um, so those those little tweaking of your collection can be done during this this um, sort of reevaluation or accessioning of your materials. Can I get the next slide, please? <clears throat> so, um, along with we've we've talked a little bit about these things in the last two um, uh, webinars, but I just pop up here again. Um, these are. Uh, archival boxes from uh, Talis, but there are many, many uh, companies out there that sell archival boxes. And this again comes uh, around discussing the fact that if you're doing accessioning and you're working with the collection, can you upgrade, able to upgrade archival boxes? Can you use acid-free boxes, acid-free tissue when applicable? Uh, there are times to not use buffered, but to use unbuffered paper, um, but to to really start to invest. And it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. You know, you can start to move collections uh, that you're assessing or, uh, or accessioning um, at that time, pieces into new archival materials, and then put them back into your storage or if you're putting them on exhibit. Uh, polyethylene sheeting, it's something that um, can be used to uh, keep objects separate. So again, if you had open storage uh, with your collections, you can tarp off that a four mil polyethylene sheeting, just get it at the hardware store. You can use that to separate or uh, protect objects from some dirt, debris, dust, things that are floating around. Sometimes you can use it to isolate an object um, if it's showing signs of deterioration and you're not really quite what's going on but, and you're afraid it reacts to the rest of your collection, say you have mold or fungus growth on a wooden object, you can tent it or, or wrap it up in, in the polyethylene sheeting or at the bottom, that's just a four mil polyethylene bag. Um, that's a bag thicker than what you get at the grocery store. I just show you that, that that's another nice storage uh, option for, for objects sometimes. Um, and you can write right on the, the bag itself with a Sharpie, which is perfectly fine. The bag is inert. 
So um, those are um, other things that I would kind of have as your your bag of tricks, so to speak, for when you're doing your accessioning and your labeling. Um, one last thing um, that will tie into the next slide that I can mention, and they are wonderful systems, and, and if you can afford it, I think they're great, is to actually get barcode uh, labels for your collections. Um, they can be um, placed, the barcode can be placed on open shelving so that you know the object that belongs on that shelf you can scan it with a barcode scanner and you know exactly sort of one-to-one -one that here's the spot on the shelf, here's the, the, um, the barcode, and that barcode that can then be entered into a database. Um, I mean, obviously, it's so can a numbering system, but barcodes and barcode readers are sort of the current state of the art for accessioning collections. Um, but um, not everybody can afford them. You know, they can be they can be expensive, and you have a little bit of uh, a learning curve to make sure that you've got um, the system down. Uh, the other thing with barcodes and barcode readers is um, you still have to apply the barcode either to a shelving unit, to an archival box, or if you're going to be applying them to an object, are you going to put that on a archival tag that's going to be tied to it. So they're wonderful, they're good, I, I recommend them, but they have some limitations on how you, you can apply them to the object itself. So that just takes a little, you know, tweaking in your institutions of how can I apply it successfully? Can I use an adhesive that is reversible or archival? The, are the um, barcodes printed up on archival material, you know, so on and so forth. That's, that's something that you can all, if you want to go down that route, uh, um, investigate. But barcodes and barcode readers are, are a nice tool to have. Can I have the next slide? Um, so this just brings to two um, forms of recordation. Um, the um, FileMaker Pro, that's the one on the left, um, that's a program that I've had for years. Uh, I put it here today up as, as not that I'm necessarily recommending that you go out and buy this one, but it, it is um, less expensive. It's still not cheap, but it's a few hundred dollars, um, like three or so, for this database. And then... Um, Sort of the um, industry standard and the one that everybody knows uh, is pa uh, is Path to Perfect. Um, that is really set up to do museum um, database systems for collections. So either work um, if you can afford the Path Perfect. Um, it's a great great system, and you can tailor uh, them to your specific institution or tuition. Um, there, are, for both of them, are webinars on how to use the systems, all kinds of uh, templates. Uh, both systems will allow you to create a template so you can uh, create sort of the long form or a short form. Um, I might recommend in something that I do when I'm going through collections and accessioning a, a, a large amount of of materials is I'll do like a um, uh, print out a short form and or if you're working with a laptop or you have another device that you can pull up the sort of short form and I, I uh, arrange the fields to have uh, boxes so I can do a check where it's cracked, it's chipped, it's dusty, it's dirty, it's broken, all of the sort of adjectives um, to do a quick, basic uh, evaluation of the object, and then you can enter your session number if you've already assigned it, or at that point, digitally put one into the system. You can embed in either one of these databases um, photographs so that you have um, uh, a, maybe a photograph from something that you have in the archives. You can embed 
a digitized image that you had. Maybe the collection came in in 1935, so you have a historic photo, and now you can take an additional photograph of what it looks like in 2021 and have that comparison. So both of these databases allow you to manipulate the data. Um, you can then do a long form, which can be in prose, where you're really describing the object, what its affiliation or its provenance to a historic home or an individual. You can really um, put a, a, a fair amount of material into that document. So you can create a document for each object or a group of objects. If, if you got in a collection of architectural elements and you have 500 nails, well, you know, you can list them as one unit of 500 nails and take a representative photograph of one or two of the nails and, and move on to the next object. So it really does allow you uh, a, a large amount of flexibility. And I know, I think Gina's worked with, with uh, Past Perfect in the past. Um, and it, uh, it, it really does make the archiving and uh, accessioning of your collections, as well as keeping a, a conservation record, it, it really works beautifully for small and medium-sized institutions. Um, I use a database when I'm working on a large collection because then I can turn that around and print it out for a client. Uh, and it'll list all my conservation treatments um, that I may carry out the same treatment on 50 things. So instead of doing 50 different, writing out 50 different treatments, I can just plug in um, from the template what I've done to all of these things and generate the photographs. So it really, it streamlines things uh, considerably. And you can, as I say, go back and start to take historic documentation and digitize that and start to um, merge the, the new information with the older information so you now have a, uh, a current uh, evaluation of your object. So can I get, um, uh, yeah, well, where's the other, I guess go on, yep, yep, we'll go on to gifts. So. I just put this picture in um, as a bit of a joke because when institutions are offered collections, um, I've seen them offer, oh, well, here, I have this stuff, and I'd love to give it to you. And, and you, you wonder, what did I do that day that they think so poorly of me that they want to give me all this stuff? So um, there sometimes – is a treasure inside the clutter, and uh, you have to unfortunately take a lot of unwanted materials to get that one object, um, or you like a, a, a bunch of the objects works for your uh, particular institution. I'm sure you all have, um, you know, a, a guideline for uh, accepting donations, and you, you have sort of the framework of what your institution is is about. If it's if it's a house museum, or it's set for a certain time period, or um, your mission statement, basically of of how you conduct your your uh, collections. So the, it really does open up a whole kettle of fish with. Um, getting new gifts in, getting new collections. Um, what I had mentioned earlier, I think it's, it's critical when you are receiving gifts into an institution that you do have that clean space. Um, I've known many, many institutions that have received some materials, and with it they received um, insects, and they've received mold in other instances, and when once insects got into a collection, then they had um, powder post beetles, which eat the wood, other uh, situations where uh, a house museum that I'm working with had um, uh, carpet beetles and just ate through um, 
most of the uh, <laughs> most of the woolen rugs um, by the time they got to to treat them. So it's very very critical to have a um, clean space when you're bringing new collections in while you're accessioning them or bringing them into the collection. Um, from that, then you can obviously make your decisions on what is is kept in a collection, what is not kept in a collection. Uh, it's it's quite a slippery slope when you are discussing deaccessioning, which is the bad word that in museums you occasionally have to work with. Uh, sometimes the gift comes with language and um, and uh, a lot of legalese that would prevent the collection being separated. So you have to take all of the stuff that you're really not so interested in along with the one object because that's how the the gift or the the, the materials were donated. Um, I found in, in my experiences, if you want to deaccession an object, whether it be uh, a recent gift or donation, or even something that's been in your collection for a long period of time, uh, um, going the route of finding another um, sister organization or museum that would be interested in accepting that object, uh, even at some of the very large institutions in, in say, New York City, um, may have collected, uh, you know, 50, 100 masks from the same uh, group in Africa, and they have them in their ethnographic collections, and, and some are lesser quality, and some have, have insect damage, so how do you go about getting rid of some of these pieces within your collections. And you can't just put them out on the curb for the garbage man, but can you find another institution that would even like something of lesser quality or may not have a problem with some of the deterioration of an object because they don't have one of that. And if you've got six, you really don't need seven. So you can try to um, find other institutions to deal with um, deaccessioning out of yours. It's a very, very difficult uh, subject and lots has been written on it um, in a lot of different uh, organizations and museums and uh, at the American Institute for Conservation, which is the group that I belong to, uh, about deaccessioning. Um, you may be aware of this or you may not be aware of it, but if you are trying to go for um, uh, basically, if, if you want your institution to be recognized uh, for its credentials and you want certification, and it, it is usually a, a, a several-year process for certification. Some of you, your institutions, you may already have certification. But to go for certification, that opens you up to um, a lot of funding avenues of grant monies through certification, but you have to uh, follow guidelines and, and show that you have things like a curation plan, a uh, uh, exhibition plan, a disaster preparedness and recovery plan. All of these things have to be ticked off before you can get the certification. Once you have that as an organization, then you are free to, to apply for federal monies that you may not be able to access prior to that. But the caveat is that deaccessioning or just walking something out to the curb is um, really uh, not looked in a favorable light. So um, that would be something that you have to do the pros and cons of dealing with deaccessioning. Certainly if you have collections that may be from a descendant community, whether it be Native American or African American or whomever, there may also be uh, claims to uh, ownership or title. So um, each institution has to deal with a variety of, of those types of scenarios. Uh, but gifts, as you I'm sure are all well aware, gifts can be um, 
far far from a gift. <laughs> it can be a big headache. Um, so I, I, you know, we can open that up later for a little bit more uh, in discussions if if you have personal um, uh, issues with with some thing that's happened in the past, or we can kind of brainstorm or just commiserate on these kinds of uh, issues. So if, can I get the, um, yeah. So loans, um, I don't know if any of your institutions typically loan or or, or uh, receive loans, um, but they too can be very, very difficult and daunting uh, scenarios. Um, objects coming in as a loan, um, obviously can come with all kinds of issues of um, environmental problems, um, mold, mildew, um, insects, all kinds of things. Also, objects can be uh, uh, loaned and may not be stable uh, at all and change dramatically. I've seen this uh, happen numerous times where an object came into a museum uh, on a loan situation and because the humidity and temperature was so vastly different than the way it was stored um, in the other institution or sometimes in a private home that the object started to uh, move and crack and and spit split and uh, all kinds of, of damage uh, can occur so documentation again um, a condition assessment when an object comes into your facility and the same way is if you are loaning something out to fully document the object before it leaves you. Um, I was involved this, this last summer with a, a loan to uh, an institution in Philadelphia and we really we, we documented everything right down to the nuts and bolts, the screws, the frames, everything. Um, so that we had a clear path to understanding what it looked like as it left the one institution and then was on loan for six months. And then when it comes back the same way, it gets reassessed before it comes back to the lending institution. And I would say the same thing uh, if you're accepting collections or um, loaning collections out that the recordation and the uh, photo documentation. I'm uh, in the midst of a court case as a professional uh, witness um, for a sculpture with a $7 million price tag that has been litigated since 19, uh, since 2017 and no end in sight. So the only reason why I mention that at all is that sometimes loans um, things go wrong. Things can go wrong. So if you've um, if you've documented and you've uh, are aware of the environmental issues, you can deal with uh, supplemental things like art sorb or silica gel to maintain the the humidity levels, or you can restrict the light, or when an object is going out, you should have a whole loan agreement that spells out in no uncertain terms how things are to be, like in this case with this natural history specimen, how are they created? How are they handled? Do you have an art handler that's doing it, or are you just going to put it in the back of your car and drive it someplace? Um, nothing is, is right. Nothing is wrong. You just have to be aware of the potential um, issues that may develop. So if you have a uh, art handling firm that comes in, they're usually bonded, they're, they're well insured, and they will then take responsibility for the shipping and uh, handling of the artwork, whether it's leaving or coming to your institution. Um, in that large uh, uh, case for the sculpture, unfortunately, the institution that was um, borrowing it did not um, use an art handling company that was um, they signed off on their insurance so now it's back over to the person that uh, borrowed the artwork and seven million dollars is no small chunk of change to be on the hook for so 
all of these things, each step, each um, bit of handling, moving, shipping, all of those things can be recorded. And if, if you are using that database, all of that can be recorded in Path Perfect or in the um, uh, Factor Pro. And you can kind of create a, um, say you're going to uh, provide an object on loan to another institution for a particular time period, and it's going to be used um, in some interpretive uh, uh, a way, you can have all of that information recorded down in your database. And then um, you can even inquire halfway through the loan or two thirds through the loan, per, please provide me, <coughs> pardon me, uh, more information on how the object is that can then go back into your assessment and back into your recording in your database. So all of this stuff is sort of very flexible and, and um, can really provide a lot of information going back and forth. And the big thing I could say about loans is just don't do them. <laughs> so um, I guess the, the towards the end, I guess my next slide um, just again, give some uh, reference information for everyone. Um, at the bottom, I, I added the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Work. Um, if it should be, uh, it should be a hot button. You should be able to, to click on that, I hope, and it might take you to the site, but um, it is a organization of colleagues, um, of mine, um, I don't know them well, but I I know what they have been doing and what their outreach um, has been in the past. They're a good source for webinars and workshops for two-dimensional artwork. So um, they're on YouTube um, for a few of them, but uh, it's uh, it's it's another resource. I think you could look at and uh, you might want to just sit through one of their webinars um, that might talk about things like reframing or uh, even accessioning uh, and using different materials. It, it's just a good resource. So that was just one other company that I thought was good to add to the mix. And I think at this point, then I, I guess we're just uh, – at the point where we can open it up maybe for some discussion. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm going to take my mask off because I can barely hear myself. Uh, <laughs> that was great. That was absolutely great and um, very, very informative. So I thank you very much for that. Uh, I have a few questions. Please. Okay. First one was, you talked about certification. Yes. Certification of what? Your institution. So it would be certification through the museum. You'd be recognized as a institution. So that is through the um, uh, AAM, American uh, Association for Music. And, and once that certification, say, for instance, you wanted to um, proceed with a CAP grant, uh, which is a condition assessment of it could be your physical facility, it could be your collections, it could be both. Those CAP surveys, um, there are ways of, of getting them funded uh, um, outside of the, the the normal system, but if you're an accredited institution, you can get these sort of federal monies to do something like a CAP grant, which would look at um, upgrading of systems or would would give you information on the your collection, uh, uh, collection care. Um, say you wanted to try to get a HVAC system upgrade. Um, once you have things like accreditation or certification, you would then be able to apply for federal monies. Okay, that's another question we had. So 
without this, and what did you just saw a CAP grant? What was that? CAP, CAP, C A P. C A P. Okay, CAP grant, and it was condition yeah. assessment. Yeah. And that can be, that can be, I'm writing um, this all down. That can be the facility itself. It can be the collections. It can be a combination of both. It can be also uh, used to help uh, fine tune things like a disaster preparedness and or disaster recovery. Uh, someone can come in and do a cap um, uh, analysis to see you know, things like, well, how are the foundations? What's the water level? What are the windows like? What are, you know, so you can, you can really get a lot of information and to get a full cap assessment, usually you have to be um, accredited. Okay. You know, it can't be, you can't just be, because, you know, you could, I could, I could be a museum myself just by, you know, myself, I could just say, well, come in, every other Thursday <laughs> and, and see, see my living room. And that, and that could I have be, a problem with that. Right, right. But I would be limited to the types of, of grant monies or um, things that I would be able to apply for. Okay, so um, there's, that, that takes me to my next question. Are there other grants available without the American Association of Museums cer certification? There are. Um, they tend to be state grants. Um, they tend to be grants that you'll find through county county monies through mm -hmm. historic preservation grants. Um, and you know, if you have an institution and you have a a, a structure that's on, on the national registry, well, that sort of frees up a little bit more federal and state money for grants in that way um, okay i i'm uh i'm working it, it's an interesting um the way they divide things up even at the county level so i'm working on a project and i i just say this to sort of uh dramatize how different it is there's a in um in whippany new jersey and the cemetery is no longer uh, affiliated with any um, congregation and or church. And the town has basically taken on the responsibility for that cemetery. And I have another cemetery in Flanders that still is somewhat connected to the um, congregation. And the cemeteries are basically uh, contemporary of each other and that church with its cemetery has been landmarked and the cemetery in Whippany has been landmarked and they're both in Morris County one is eligible for county preservation money and one is not the one that is in Whippany because it's through the town is eligible for preservation monies and they have been quite successful in the last five years receiving grant monies from from preservation the one in flanders has not received and is Ill out ineligible for any um county monies because it is still affiliated with the congregation so they said if you're going to document if you're going to repair it's all on you it's on the church so even though they're both have recognized as both of them being on the national registry so it it depends it's you know it's, it's a very difficult um thing to tease out where you're how you're able to get monies from one organization and someone else is not able to it, it's a difficult it's a difficult thing yeah um because right now I put I I have it with me. Our entire collection is kept in a blue notebook. Gotcha. And nothing has been digitalized, and that's one of so that's uh, that's what our main interest here is. We need to to and there are hundreds 
if not thousands of, and it's mostly ephemera. It's mostly paper things. But um, the, my no, another question I had is, um, how do you evaluate condition? So, I mean, there, there's the obvious, obvious, you know, right. things like, okay, it's torn. Right. It's, it's, you know, got a big hole in it. Um, but that's why if you were getting down to the minutia of, okay, this, this piece is, you can't visually see that it's got nitric acid. If, if it's like the plastic that I talked about, like the celluloid or something like that. You can't really see that what's going on. You might notice the pain forming or some shrinkage or warping. Um, so there are some things you're absolutely correct. You're not going to really be able to completely yeah. evaluate, but it's the best you can do visually. I mean, you can do some instrumentation okay. with magnification and okay. things like that, but you're not going to be able to unless you had – that's why I come back to say a cap survey where they can kind of, you know, with more instrumentation or more testing right. or more analysis, that kind of equipment, they can come in and say, well, gee, these, this is happening, this is not happening, and more instrumentation. But, yeah, for, for a basic down and dirty, it, is, it, is it torn, is it, bent, yeah. is it warped, those kinds of things. Okay. Like, all right. Um, I'm going to let them go. One, one last thing for, her, I think, everybody. Um, I can't necessarily um, offer anyone services, clearly, but if you're not aware of the training program at um, Seton Hall University, there is a, a museum studies program at Seton Hall and they have a um, a track, a graduate program track in um, registrarial uh, work. And I know that each one of the kids that goes through that program has to do an internship for so many hours a week and or month. Oh. So it depends you know, how accessible, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that you could get a second year um, graduate student from that program to come out and spend an hour or two a week or maybe a half a day a week, depends on how many hours yeah. they need to accumulate, and go through and help you with those those collections. So. There is a museum studies program at Rutgers. There's one at Seton Hall, I know, and there might be one, I believe, at um, Montclair State. Um, and they all need hours. You know, they all have to do an internship as part of their program. That's if, wonderful information. Thank you. Yeah. If you have textiles within your collection, um, there is a graduate program at FIT, um, Fashion Institute of Technology, um, in their costume and textile uh, program. They, too, need internship hours. So if you've got a lot of – or, you know, one – it could be one object. It could be one flag. It could be one Revolutionary War uniform, something like that. Um, they might take that into – um, the program and use it for the students to say clean or rebox, rehouse, things like that. Great, thanks. Carrie, there's a question from Rayla Masters in the chat box. He wants yeah. to know won't sealing in the bags keep textiles or other items from breathing? It's true. And, and if you have a good environment, you do want it to have a little air exchange. Um, I'm talking more about when you don't have a good environment and you might have um, the humidity is way too high or you know you have mold or mildew, then yes, I would think about keeping something or isolating it. You know, if, if the one object is 
causing the problem. You can seal it and isolate it in the bag. But if you have a good HVAC system or a good, you know, relatively good airflow, then yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily seal something up. Um, but uh, I use the example of the uh, of the, the dresser set. Um, I would something like that. I would not want it to be uh, in the regular air exchange. I would want that either boxed or sealed or something where um, you don't want a lot of air exchange. If you have collections that are silver. Um, where you're running the risk of tarnish and it's not on exhibition, it's, it's not on view, then uh, a lot of institutions keep them in four mil polyethylene bags that are sealed or twist tied shut so that they don't tarnish or don't tarnish as quickly. So it's, it's not a either or, it's a when you should and when you shouldn't, depending on which objects you're talking about. I have a question. Sure. When, when you were, I have to back up to my PowerPoint. <laughs> and by the way, everybody, I sent y'all a copy of the PowerPoint so you have the resource information and Gary's contact info. Um, when you were talking about the um, little plastic, or no, not plastic. What were those? Um, where is it? For labeling. Uh huh. Right. Those those little. Um, B uh, B seventy two. Right. Yeah. So, how do you so you melt it down and then you yeah. put it on the object itself and then you write the number on it once it cools and then you put more of it on top to seal it? Is that how that yeah, works? Yeah, it, it it just basically once you dissolve the it's not a heat thing. It's a it's just a dissolve. You okay. take some of the beads. You can do it in a any jar really. You can and you add the acetone to the jar with the beads. And it usually takes several hours or overnight. Once the beads dissolve into the acetone, you'll get it to be the consistency of like fingernail polish, maybe right. even a little a little thinner, but but basically a thin coat. Then you can just use a brush, um, you know, a little like the same type of brush that you would have with fingernail polish, mm -hmm. something with acetone. Um, either uh, maybe a natural fiber brush or um, something that's not going to be affected by the solvent. And then you apply one coat down onto the object, let it dry, and, and you label. And then to make sure that that labeling doesn't wipe off or doesn't get abraded, you put another coat on top. Okay. And that second coat on top, you put down pretty quickly because if you if you keep you know applying that top coat and do it very slowly and and you know play around with it, you'll actually undercut. You'll dissolve the 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 coat below. So the first coat goes on as as slowly as you want to do it. When you label it, then the top coat you just kind of swipe it on quickly you know you do it one one wipe down and, and that's it you're done because if you're messing around with it the acetone will actually dissolve the bottom coat it's sort of like fingernail polish in the sense that if you keep messing around with it and keep applying it, it'll soften the one below it um, but what's nice about the b72 is it doesn't yellow and it can be um, removed 10, 20, 30 years in, in the, you know, going forward. The nice thing about conservation product is for them to be uh, offered as a material to be used in a museum setting or in a collection. They all go through rigorous, rigorous um, uh, testing. And if you buy a material like B72 through a reputable conservation uh, company, you know what you're buying. The problem with going to, say, the hardware store or, you know, buying even even the fingernail polish, you're not necessarily sure what you're going to get. The, the ingredients may or may not be fully listed. Um, 
the batches may change from sometimes they might put, you know, a little bit more of this in or a little less of that. It, it, there isn't the quality control, but if you're buying something like B72, it's been tested, it's been evaluated, it's sort of given the seal of approval, and you know that if you buy one bag of it today, the next bag you buy in a year from now, it's going to be the same stuff. Okay. Gary, <clears throat> excuse me, Gary. Yeah. Um, acetone uh, uh, evaporates very, very quickly. Uh, when you mix up this mixture that you're trying to, to get to the consistency of polish, um, you need to keep that jar closed. Uh, yeah. Pretty tightly. You, you do need to keep the you need to keep the top on. By the time you get the ratio, which is more or less 50-50, it's 50% acetone, 50% the um, B72. By the time you get that, the evaporation rate is reduced. It's not like a, a plain uh, container of acetone. But if you also um, restrict, obviously, the evaporation with um, a lid or you use a narrow uh, opening at the top and the jar is a wider jar. If you don't have like a wide mouth jar, that too can reduce the, 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 the rapidness of the evaporation. It's just like if you're using the, the fingernail polish with the methyl methacrylate, that evaporates really pretty quickly too. Um, so the, the other thing that I would, um, if you're going to label objects with the B72, and I, I think it's a very good product for a whole host of things, be advised too, if you're going to apply that and put a label on, say, a piece of furniture, well, if you're doing that, you have to know first and foremost, will acetone affect the varnish or the finish on that piece of furniture? So if it does, well, maybe you put it on a, an area that's, that's uh, underneath, say, or, or you, you can't see it, it's by maybe a hinge or uh, it's by a, you know, whatnot, so that you're not damaging the, the surface of the actual object. So there's, you know, there's places for it and places where you would never use it. Or if it's untreated wood, if it's a leg or something, you might be able to find an area where, um, where you can apply it. Um, and if if you can go to something like a um, uh, a scanner and do the barcode, you might not even need any kind of solvent system. You could almost stick it on. Um, not all stickers are equal, though, um, yeah. depending on what the adhesive uh, is on, on the label. Well, then you might be marring the surface as well, you know. So if you've got an adhesive that's acid-free and won't react, then that's fine. So it's really all in where you're applying it and how you're doing it and to what, you know, if it's, it's, it's say, it's the back of a frame and it's, it's unfinished or untreated wood, well, then the B72 works fine. But if it's a mahogany dining room table, I don't want to mark on the front, you know. <laughs> so... What what advice could you give us, uh, those of us who have maps that are on linen? Oh, okay. What advice can you give us? Uh, are, are they rolled uh, because, or unrolled? Uh, both. I have both. Ah, okay. Um, well, and I have I have. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I was I was going to say. Um, you know, again, for uh, marking, I would say if you, if there's any way of attaching a paper label that's, that's, you know, on a string or something like that for maybe the rolled ones. Otherwise, in the small, in the backs, on the ones that are uh, linen lined, you can always just use a pencil, do some minimal recording on the back there. Um, for storage, I would, try to, you know, get an archival box, and then I would uh, create like a bolster inside the box for the rolled and, and 
um, and, and you could put multiple pieces in one box. But I would use the acid-free uh, tissue almost to create a nest for them so that they are separated from each other. The ones that are flat, whether they have a thing or not, I would then do flat file. And again, maybe pencil on the back side for the maps. Let, yeah, I mean, that's if they're most paper maps, but if they're vellum or any kind of other maps that are other materials, um, I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't write on them. Now, I have paper, I have linen, I have vellum. Um, okay. But in some of the linen maps, um, they are actually, the surface is actually cracking and some yeah. of the very, very fine pieces are coming off. And yeah. that's uh, a very big concern to me. Right. Um, it might be some of that problem, the age, um, sometimes the humidity or lack thereof, you know, if it fluctuates very high to very low to very high to very low can cause that dimension because the paper, the paper's moving differently than the backing. So if it's a linen, the linen is responding to the environment differently than the paper is, and they sort of pull each other apart. Um, it's, it's really common with those maps. The other thing they did with maps sometimes, I, you may have them in your collection, is they have actually um, uh, put like a varnish or a, a coating on the surface of the paper. So you might have linen, paper, and then some type of coating on the surface. Those three things are incompatible with each other and they don't, they don't age well. Um, Outside of um, changing the, the storage conditions of either flat file or um, nestling them, rolling them, um, you you might, if the humidity seems to fluctuate in your area, you might try to store them with something like silica gel or art sorb. I don't know if you were with us with the last uh, webinar, but I, I mentioned a product called art sorb. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, it's sold. I think you can even go on on uh, Amazon, but places like uh, Gaylord sells it, and it it's a little sachet or a little cardboard box. And what Artsorb does that silica gel does not. Silica gel works only in one way, one direction. It pulls moisture out of the air, or out of the environment that the object is. Say it's in a box it pulls it out and it stores it in that. Art sorb actually works where if it gets too dry, the art sorb, <clears throat> pardon me, actually gives off the moisture, the humidity, back out of the crystals, out into the object. So it goes both, it, it absorbs, but it also releases. So it's a great little product. Um, if you have very sensitive, um, uh, two-dimensional pieces like maps or prints or other things like that. Sometimes art sorb in the storage box or in the storage cabinet is a is a good next step. Thank you. Yep. So there's also another comment from Ray in the in the chat box. It says, aside from objects, should documents be accessioned? Oh, everything within your institutions should be accessioned. Yep. Yeah, there anything that's come in or has been there that predates you <laughs> in any way should all be a session because it's the only way that you'll know how big or how small your collection is, and and it will really be the way that you'll track their um, their condition and if things are changing or you know yeah there's really no object that should be in an institution unless you're <coughs> Sub segregating a section of a collection that you could use as a teaching tool, and then you may not want to accession that into your collection and put an accession number on that because um, with that, you might be able to utilize those materials and not have the restrictions that your, um, your, your institution has in its framework or its guidelines uh, for practice. So 
sometimes people have working collections that don't they don't accession but yeah everything else should be numbered in some fashion or some way whether it's on the physical object or assigned to it in a box or on a table or on a you know in a storage bin something like that So Gary had mentioned that um, Ship and Manor has, or actually Warren County has the past perfect. It is a great system when you figure it out. I'm probably 70% figured it out. We did put the option in for barcodes. I haven't even gotten to that point yet because there's one of me and about 10,000 items I need to <laughs> I need to put in there. And some of them have accession numbers that are not recorded anywhere else, so I don't know what they refer to. Sometimes they're documented. Sometimes we have objects that are that have no provenance and we have no information about where it came from or when it came into our possession. And then we have stuff that's documented very well and photographed. <clears throat> so past perfect is expensive. Um, so we only got it for one computer. If you need it for more than one computer because your group maybe has three people that will be doing archiving from their homes, you're going to have to pay for multiple computers, which then increases it by a few thousand dollars as opposed to a few hundred dollars. And so we have it on one laptop, actually the laptop I'm on right now, and Liz has helped me do a couple items in a session because I wanted to show her how to use the program as well so that when we're done in 10 years documenting everything at Ship and Manor, because it's going to take forever, and she knows that, um, then we can hopefully move on to the other museums as well. And this way, at some point in the next 100 years, we will have a list of all of the county items that are in our possession that are our artifacts. The problem with with what I have to deal with is I have a lot of stuff to do and only one of me. But besides that, I have, like I said, irregular records. And so what I did is I went to the um, American Association of Museums, something like that, and they had sample documents because our documents are outdated. And that's something that you need to with an, as your, uh, with your group rather is to create a document that is going to be consistent and can be utilized for more than one item. So you don't want to have separate document uh, paperwork for paper documents as opposed to furniture and clothing. If you can have one document where you can fill in what the item is, and the other thing I've noticed in the lack of documentation, and I've been at Chippen for more than a year and a half now. And those files are daunting and they scare me sometimes because there's just, it's everywhere. Every single room has a file cabinet in the offices and nothing is where it's supposed to be. So I find mystery things. <clears throat> when you're documenting your items, it's very important to measure them, to document as much as you can. The color of the cloth, the type of cloth, if you can tell what it is, if it's furniture, um, the type of wood, if possible, to identify. But dimensions are so very important because when you have three sofas that are East Lake sofas like we do, and you don't define what they are, you don't know what it belongs to. And that happens a lot in the 30 years of documentation. And most of this documentation that was irregular is from the 90s. And it's probably because they didn't know. I've, I've been learning a lot about accessioning. <laughs> We're not allowed to as a county entity to give things away, um, but I can long term uh, loan them. And I have done that. But now that I know that I probably have sent the plague to somebody else's museum, <laughs> it makes me feel really nervous. And I have to call them tomorrow to make sure their stuff is okay. Um, but document with as much information as possible. When Liz and I were going through the documentation for painting collection that, that the county owns, it's very helpful when it's described clearly, where you know where the items are coming from, if there's a provenance or a history of that item, has it been passed on the family, Is, um, did your father work for Ox or your great grandfather work for Oxford Furnace and this was his toolbox. I mean, it's really important because if you go to loan those out without provenance, people tend to not want that. They want the history, the story to it as well. So document, 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 measure, size, take pictures of different angles, even underneath, um, I found that, that that's helpful. So Liz and I were doing that as well. But sometimes in the case of Shippen where nothing makes sense, I have paintings that are wired to the wall. I don't know. I'm going to figure out how to get those down, but I can't even tell if they're signed paintings because they may not be signed on the front, but they might be signed on the back, and I can't take them down to look 
because they're essentially affixed to the wall. So that's another challenge. But I have found the little whiteout with the handwritten numbers, which don't match anything else. So I'm, I'm starting fresh, or as I'm sticking with our system, which is the year, the collection number, and then the item within that collection. So, for example, it would be 2021.1.001, and that, that would start a collection. So if it's a collection of books that we received in 2021, that's how it would be numbered. And each item would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 as the last digit. And then we have an accession book to put everything in. Um, but also when you're deaccessioning, we had to deaccession a severely broken piece of furniture that was put in storage improperly. And I had to go through, find the paperwork first, which was, you know, difficult because I, it took me a while to find it. And then I had to mark on it was deaccessioned and why and took pictures of it so that we have documentation. Fortunately, most of the things that have been loaned to the manor have been gifted without uh, restriction, which essentially means that you can do whatever you want with the item. But we also have a couple items where um, in the documentation from the owner, the, the gifter, is that we must keep it in perpetuity at the museum. So that puts us in a situation where if I want to move it out or I want to loan it out or it no longer is functional as a piece and it's fallen apart or is broken, that also adds complications to it as well. So do you suggest, or how, how would you suggest, Gary, with an item that I have to deaccession that is not numbered and not recorded, should I still deaccession, do the deaccession paperwork, or should I just notate? Technically, if, if it has no number and it has not been recorded in any other file that you can't find, technically it's not part of your collection. Okay. So that is your out <laughs> by saying, well, it's, it's, it never received a number and therefore it's really, it's not in our records. It's just been dropped off because that happens from time to time. People loan stuff for an event and it just lives there with you. And, and it was really never meant to be part of your collection or maybe it was meant to be part of your collection, but it was never accessioned in. So, yeah, there is that certain gray area, <clears throat> obviously, is if it has no uh, accession information, there's no file uh, uh, attributed to that object, then, yeah, you can kind of make that go away. A lot of things are on, on uh, extended permanent loan, and the only time people know is if it damaged or broken and then oh we don't own that um i didn't know and then you have to research well who's the lending institution and i i did a um a large four foot tall uh, uh asian vase that was loaned to an institution and they thought they owned it and it wasn't until it was knocked over and broke that they realized oh gee we don't own this and then there's the insurance and the, you know, the conservation and the reconstruction and all of that game after the fact. But lots of things are left. Basically, it's the orphan at the door, or uh, you know, like you, you'll come across a whole bunch of things. So whether you use those objects in any kind of interpretive way, or if they're so. Um, fragmented or, or broken or deteriorating that they no longer tell the story that, or there's no provenance, then, you know, it, when, when does a spoon just become a, a spoon of, you know, it's garbage or when does it become something important? It's the, the provenance of the object, the ownership, the, the history behind it. Otherwise it's just a spoon. So the long winded thing is, if there's no record and there's no accession, you're pretty much you, you can make it go away. Okay, good. Does anybody else have any questions for Gary? We are good. Had a, a lovely afternoon, so we're right off. <laughs> good, good talking to you. Take care. Thank you. I've got a 20 minute my home, and I want to get there before it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, ladies. Bye now. Thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. All right. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, everyone. Hi, Ken. How are you?
I'm fine, Liz. Good to see you. Hi, Gary. Hi. How's it been? Good, good. Hanging in there with all the craziness of of the times we live in. <laughs> yep. uh, but yeah, I have okay. to. My big thing is I have to go down in December to the U.S. Capitol to work on a large sculpture. And with all the craziness that's happening down there, I'm like, oh, thank goodness it's February and not January. Absolutely. Hope it's all somehow calmed down by then. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. I'm counting on it. So. so, Liz, if you want to stop the recording. Okay. That would be good. And then um, I'm afraid to have Gary come to Shippen because I think he's going to have a